In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The title of tonight's talk is, You Are My Beloved Son. Let's kind of recap a little bit about yesterday. We have the woman at the well, this unknown Samaritan woman. She encounters Jesus, who is thirsting for her, who is thirsting for her soul, who is thirsting for her faith and for her love. She encounters this look of love that he gives to her. He looks right into her heart, right into her heart as a divine surgeon, a divine physician, and slowly repairs all those wounds, everything that was damaged in there. This look of his touches the depths of her being, and she leaves the encounter transformed. She runs off, leaving her jar behind. She has experienced God's love. She has recognized in truth, in humility, her own situation. She has responded with love, with faith to Jesus. She repents of her sin. And repentance, in a sense, is this key to our whole journey of faith. Repentance is born of the encounter with Jesus Christ. Repentance is born of looking at Jesus who looks on us with such love. The foundation for repentance is humility. Humility. And humility is not when someone tells you, oh, that was great. Oh, no, no, it wasn't. Or you sounded wonderful. Oh, no, really, no, I missed that high D over there. That's, that's not humility. Humility is recognizing the truth about oneself. The truth about us is that we are creatures. We have been created We have been given our nature. We didn't choose, none of us on our own, to be a human being, to be this particular human being. We did not choose when we would be born or where or how. And I'm sure we all would agree we didn't choose our families, right? There's so much that we didn't choose. Existence itself, life itself is given to us. Recognition of this truth reminds us of our reality, of where we are in the scheme of things. That is humility. That is humility. The recognition of the truth. Recognition of our brokenness. Recognition that just as we did not determine ourselves, we also are not really in control of everything, much as we like to. Much as we like to. Humility. Recognition of the truth of our situation. This woman who starts out with this dialogue, theological dialogue about Jacob's well and so on, after experiencing repentance, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit, after having Jesus reveal her sins to her, after having experienced this look of love that he has for her, She leaves the encounter. She leaves the encounter full of joy. She leaves the encounter like this wellspring of joy bursting forth from her. What is joy? What is joy? We recognize the word and we certainly can think of times we have been joyful. But what is it? What is it? We can turn to our guide, our master, St. Thomas Aquinas, to kind of give us some good distinctions. St. Thomas, following the classical tradition, says that we experience delight, pleasure, whenever we are in possessed of a good that we desire. Yesterday after Mass, Carla was selling all those donuts, and a donut is in of itself desirable. It's good. It's good. That sugar is speaking to us. Right? And when we possess it, when we consume it, we, we feel pleasure in our body, in our taste buds, and so on. That's one kind of a 
delight. So any kind of a possession of a desired good leads to delight. That is the product of our desire for something that is good. It's the effect, if you will. Joy, however, pertains only to rational creatures, creatures who have the ability to reason, to think, to reflect, creatures who have the ability to freely choose. And we might not think of ourselves sometimes as being too rational, but each and every one of us is. Because God has made us with a rational soul, with this capacity. If we had a dog out there at that table of donuts yesterday, that dog would follow its instincts. And if we were not looking, we would have a very smaller table of donuts. <laughs> so the dog will simply follow its instincts. The instinct is this is something that is desirable, it's good, it's going to give me pleasure, and he will follow that. To the point, well, sometimes to the point of not even realizing how much he's had. And human beings sometimes behave that way. But the human being, we are able to think. We are able to receive this good with reason. With the use of our mind. And by reason, I don't just mean like mathematical ability. I don't mean, you know, being able to do equations or science. It's this ability we have of knowing reality in a way. The, the fact that we can call it a donut. The dog doesn't have any word for it except, mmm, real good. That feeling, right? We have the ability to think, to reflect. And delight in something that is good for us, that is apprehended using our reason, that we understand using our reason, is joy. Is joy. Only a spiritual creature, only human beings and angels the two spiritual creatures of the visible and invisible creation are able to experience joy. Irrational animals can only experience this delight, this pleasure that is at the animal level. Joy is always personal. This is the way God has made us. Think of it this way. There's a certain kind of pleasure we get from that donut, but there's a different kind of pleasure we get in the presence of a loved one. When a friend who has been gone for long, maybe a son or a daughter who is overseas serving, when she comes back, we get a feeling of delight, certainly, but it's more than that. It's more than simply the joy or the delight we feel when we eat a donut. It's born out of the love for a person, born out of the love for a person. Their presence fills us with joy, and that's what we call joy. And it's not simply the kind of delight we get from any kind of bodily good, such as food. Or another example of that is when we, you know, the person might not be with us, we might not be in their company, but we know they're doing well. Say, you know, you may have kids who are in other parts of the country or overseas maybe, and you know they're well, you wish them well, you get a phone call, and there's that feeling of, of delight, of, of being pleased because your son or your daughter, you know that they're well. So this is joy at a human level, but one that involves a personal encounter. It's of a higher level than the joy or the delight that we feel when we get that donut. And similarly, the absence of a person fills us with the opposite, sadness. And the absence of a person, or the presence of a person who might be suffering something, fills us with sadness. So what is joy? It is the presence of the person we love, the fact that the person that we love is doing well. Well, why aren't we more joyful? Why aren't we more joyful? We are surrounded sometimes, you know, we've got our families, we've got our friends. Most often it is because the object of our love, the object of our desire, is not that which is going to satisfy and fulfill us completely. We know this, we know this. If someone makes the object of their desire simply bodily pleasure, whether it be food, whether it be just the delights of life, whether it be carnal pleasure, they're not going to experience the higher kind of joy, and they're not going to be satisfied. 
They're going to be like that woman coming to the well with a jar that is not going to fill her thirst. Or someone who has made it his life's ambition to get as much wealth as he can. That is not the object, the proper object, solely for a human being to pursue. Or someone who has made it her life's ambition to have honor or power or respect. All of these things which are good in of themselves we desire But when we make them the purpose of our life, when our life seems to be more about these things, it does not fill us. It leaves us empty. We know this. We know these from examples maybe from our own life, from literature, from the movies of people who are so consumed by ambition or so consumed by passion. It's almost as if they twist their humanity. They lose sight of what is really important. This is why we are not more joyful. This is why we don't really find the ultimate happiness that all of us desire, that all of us desire. St. Paul tells us in the letter to the Philippians, rejoice always. It's like, well, that's nice. How am I supposed to do that? How am I supposed to do that? Well, the key is to realize what corresponds really to the desire of my heart. What corresponds to the desire of my heart And there exists a spiritual joy that has as its object something that never changes, that never fades away, that never fails, that never disappoints. And this object of our deepest desire is God, is God. And the joy that we feel when we have, in a sense, apprehended and possessed God is a joy that no one can take away, Jesus tells us. It's supernatural, it's profound, and it lasts. And this joy is not something we can produce. When St. Paul says, rejoice, we scrunch up our faces. Okay, I'm going to try and produce this joy somehow by great intensity of effort. It is something that comes from above. It comes from above from the Holy Spirit. We have said that we experience joy when we are in the presence of a beloved person. Well, this is true also of spiritual joy. St. John says, God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. If we love God, then, we are always in his presence. And this love of God comes to us interiorly through the work of the Holy Spirit. St. Paul tells us, this in the reading yesterday at Mass, that God's love has been poured into our heart through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Spiritual joy, the deepest joy, the joy that we are all made for, has God as its object. It's God as its object. And it is a joy that no one can take away. St. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And he adds that the Lord is always near. We are never, ever absent from him. We are never, ever anywhere. The psalm says, even if I go down into the depths of the netherworld, even there your hand is with me. There is no place that we can go where God is not with us. We're the ones who forget. We're the ones who forget that God is with us. We are the ones who absent ourselves from God's presence. The Lord is close at hand. And when we realize that, in a sense, our whole orientation, our whole life's goal is concentrated on this person who reveals himself to us, on God. That is when the joy that comes from the Holy Spirit floods our being. It's more than that. It's more than this presence. What God promises us is that we will share in his life, that we will be united to him. We get to participate in God's very being, The East uses the language of 
theosis, of becoming God, of divinization. This is our purpose. This is our purpose. We have this as our goal. This is our destiny. This is what we have been made for. And we kind of muck about with things like money and power and sex. Joy is more than happiness, just as happiness is more than pleasure. Pleasure is in the body. Happiness is in the mind, in our feelings. Joy is at the depth of the heart, in the spirit, the center of our self. The way to acquire pleasure, if you think about it, is through power and prudence. Prudence means doing the right thing at the right time. Power, we have to have the ability. If I want to get that donut and I'm unable to go there, I will not be pleased. I will not have that pleasure. It has to be in my ability. And so, so many people expend so much power, so much of their energy pursuing pleasure. The way to happiness, the higher level, is by following what is good, and we are called to do that. And it leads to a certain sense of peace of mind, knowing that one is pursuing the good. But the way to joy, the joy that comes from the Holy Spirit, is holiness, is sanctity. It's loving God with your whole heart, with your whole being, with your whole mind, with your whole strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. Everyone wants pleasure. God has made us with bodies. It's not as if bodily pleasures are bad in of themselves. More deeply, everyone wants happiness, but most deeply, everyone wants joy. Sigmund Freud has said that spiritual joy becomes, is a substitute for physical pleasure. People become saints because they are frustrated sexually. What's well, the exact opposite that's true? St. Thomas tells us no man can live without joy. And that is why one deprived of joy goes to carnal pleasures. It is because we have not found God as our object that we look for God everywhere else. Sanctity is never a substitute for sex. But sex is often a substitute for the desire for holiness. Now, throughout the ages, for the 2,000 years of the existence of the church, Millions of people have found the path to joy. They have taken up the invitation that has come to them. And they have found this path. No one who has ever said to God, thy will be done, and meant it with his heart, ever failed to find joy. Not just in heaven, not just down the road somewhere, but here in this world in this very moment, here and now. In the very act of our self-surrender to God, there is joy. Not just later, not just, okay, we'll promise you this, just kind of be miserable now and ignore what everything else says was gonna give you happiness and fun, be as miserable as you want somehow. Sometimes people think that's what Christianity is. Anything that's good for me, I can't have, right? Anything, if you've got some bodily ailment like diabetes, that's what you feel like. You know, I, anything that I really want, I can't have. Well, it's not really true when it comes to the spiritual life. It's not as if we must sacrifice everything and live on a straw pallet and wear ashes and be gray and miserable, and then God will say, good, you've been miserable enough now, and now I'll give you joy in heaven. The Christian life is the life of the human being fully alive fully oriented to that which makes us truly human, which is our relationship with God. We've all come across people who are cold, who are suspicious, who are mistrusting. These people are miserable and wretched. They can't find joy because they cannot trust. They can't have faith. In order to love, you need to trust. You need to believe. You need to have faith. And you need love to get to joy. Pope Francis has been quoted as saying, Christians should be cheerful. 
Christians cannot be sourpusses. I don't know what the Italian word it is that has been translating, but we wondered always if all the official documents end up in Latin, and what is the Latin for sourpuss, you know? I don't know. But Christians are someone who have been marked by this encounter with Jesus, who have received the gift of the Holy Spirit, who are filled with joy. And every time any Christian has ever said yes to God with even something approaching the whole of his soul, every time he has not only said thy will be done, but meant it, in that moment, in that moment, we experience joy. In that moment, we find joy. Every Christian who has ever lived has found this exact same thing in his experience. Why don't more people try it? Is there a catch? Is there something? It's too good to be true. There's got to be something that's got to give. Well, there is a catch. It's a big one, but a very simple one. And it's this. You have to really do it. You have to really surrender yourself to God. You have to actually trust him. You can't just think about it. You can't just say, I will do this on this particular day. But you have to give up and surrender. And this requires something that none of us really wants. And this requires death. It requires not death of the body, but the death of our ego the death of our self-will. We fear giving that up, really, more than we fear giving up our body. Joy is a consequence of love, is a consequence of charity. Joy comes when we love that which fully satisfies us as a human being and is always a work of the Holy Spirit which leads us to this encounter with Christ, which leads us to meet Jesus and this gaze of love, to be transformed by his love, to trust him, to surrender to him, to love him, and not just once. Every single day, we must pray for this grace. Every day. Every day. 1975, Pope Paul VI wrote a letter Gaudete in Domino, rejoice in the Lord. It's a beautiful meditation on Christian joy. And there's a beautiful section there where he talks about joy in the life of Jesus. So let's listen to what the Pope teaches us about joy in the life of Jesus. Jesus was a human being. He's the second person of the Trinity, God, but he becomes one of us. And he experiences all the joys that we can think of, such as looking out on the beauty of creation. You can imagine him when he goes up on the mountainside, looking over the sunset, over the Sea of Galilee, and rejoicing in that. Rejoicing in that. Only a spiritual being, only a rational being is capable of that. You take your puppy up there to watch the beautiful sunset, he will still be chasing donuts. He's not. He doesn't care about the sunset. He cannot see that. He cannot appreciate that. He does not have the capacity to do that. He admires the birds of the heavens, the lilies of the field. He immediately grasps God's attitude towards creation at the dawn of history when God says, it is good. It is good. He talks about the joy of the harvester, the sower, the reaper, the joy of a man who finds a hidden treasure in a field or shepherd who recovers a lost sheep, the woman who finds her lost coin, the joy of a marriage banquet, of the father embracing a son who has been lost, the joy of a woman who has just brought forth a child in this world. And for Jesus, these joys are real because for him, they are the signs of the spiritual joys of the kingdom of God, the joy of people who enter this kingdom the joy of people who return to that kingdom, the joy of the Father who welcomes them. And for his part, Jesus himself manifests his satisfaction and his tenderness when he meets children wishing to approach him, a rich young man who is faithful, friends who open their home to him like Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Most of all, there is the happiness, the joy of seeing the word accepted. 
the possessed man delivered of his demons and healed, the woman with the hemorrhage who is cured, a sinful tax collector like Zacchaeus converting and giving away half his wealth to the poor. He exalts with joy when he sees this. But it is necessary to understand that these human joys are rooted in the fundamental identity that Jesus has. If Jesus radiates such peace, such assurance, such happiness, such availability, it is by reason of the inexpressible love by which he knows that he is loved by his Father. When Jesus shows up to John the Baptist on the banks of the Jordan, This love, which is present from the first moment of his incarnation, is manifested out loud. The Father's voice is heard. You are my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. This is actually the only thing recorded in the New Testament as coming directly from the Father. Happens at Jesus' baptism, and it happens at the transfiguration. You are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. In a sense, in a sense, this is the one word of the Father for all eternity to his son. The word of love. For all eternity, the Father gives of his life, his being, in an action of love to the son. And the son receives that and returns it back to the Father And that bond between them is himself the third person of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit. That communion of eternal love, that love we only get little glimpses of here when we experience the joy we have been talking about. That love that is our destiny, that is our goal, that love for which we are being prepared to be drawn into that life of the Trinity. It is the certitude of being, of knowing that he is God's beloved son, which is at the root, the foundation, the base of every other experience of joy. I am in the Father, the Father is in me. All I have is yours and all you have is mine. I love the Father. I am doing exactly what the Father has told me. I always do what is pleasing to the Father. It is my food and my drink. His obedience and his love and his trust to the Father leads him to the point of freely giving up his life. The Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. This knowledge of the Father's love is what bursts forth in his human heart as a song of joy, as a song of joy. And this is something that all of us are invited to enter into. This is what baptism is the gate to, the life of the Holy Trinity. When we are baptized, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come dwell in our soul, take their residence, they abide there. And Jesus says, he who abides with me abides with my Father. And my joy will be full and that joy will never be taken away. Jesus says also, all these things are in the Gospel of John, by the way. I have made your name known to them. He's talking to the Father. And will continue to make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and so that I may be in them. The life of the Holy Trinity. This is what each and every one of us has been made for. From all of eternity, God has seen us He has seen us with all of our sinfulness. He has seen us with all of our brokenness, just as he saw this woman at the well with her five former husbands and the sixth one she's shacking up with. And he loved her and calls her into this communion. 
Our Christian life is a slow growing, deepening awareness of the life of the Holy Trinity that slowly takes possession of us, that slowly permeates us so that at one point the Father will look upon us and see in one of us, his adopted daughter, his adopted son, the image of his son he has loved from all eternity. That is what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. That is what it means that as Christians, we are other Christs. We are also, by adoption, what Jesus is by nature, a beloved child of God. Listen to what St. Paul, in the first chapter of Ephesians, he tells us this is our destiny. This is what we are made for. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. He destined us in love to be his sons, to be his daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he has lavished upon us. He has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things We who first hoped in Christ have been destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, you and I, here, who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, have believed in him and were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. We have been destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory. Our being, our life is there for the purpose of giving glory to the Holy Trinity. And how does the Holy Trinity achieve this glory? It is by lavishing his love upon us and by our surrender and response and growing in this love, in this communion, in this divine dance of joy, that God is given glory. This is our destiny. This joy of living in God's love begins here now. It is the joy of the kingdom of God, but it is granted on a steep road, which requires a total confidence in the Father and in the Son, and in a preference given to the kingdom. It's a demanding joy, if you will. It requires what we so don't want to give up. It requires one very simple thing. Us, all of us, requires our yes every moment to the will of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, and all these things that you seek for will be given to you. Life in Christ is a life of this joy, of knowing the deepest level of our being that we are sons and daughters of God, of having seen that look of Jesus Christ on our sin, on our brokenness, on our poverty, on our littleness, of having seen God himself, all-powerful, the creator of all that exists and all the galaxies and the stars and the cosmos, who comes down and makes himself so little and so poor, right down as a little baby, who comes on this altar in a simple wafer in order to invite us and to give us the riches of his life to draw us up to draw us up into this eternal life of love, which is the Holy Trinity. 
Knowing this, if you think about it, leads to such freedom. It leads to liberation. The things that we are so worried about. What do people think of me? Where do I fit in? How do I get ahead? How do I make sure that I am ahead of him at work? How do I make sure that my kids get the best things possible? All of these things, which are not unimportant in of themselves. All that jostling of human existence. Of all that energy on pleasure and power and wealth. Everything that will be taken from us. Even our bodies. All of that fades away when we see this one thing in front of us. The gaze of Jesus, the face of the Father, and the love that unites them, the Holy Trinity, drawing us in, inviting us, saying, follow me. Come and see. See the marvelous things. See the amazing things that happen. And you know what? Down the ages, in every age, in every time, there have been men and women who have said yes to this invitation. We see it on the pages of the New Testament. We read about it through the history of the church. The history of the church is not just the history of the councils and the bishops and the church and the crown struggling for control and power and jurisdiction. The true history of the church is the life of grace, the life of the Holy Spirit that pours down in hidden channels in every age and raises up women and men who have, like Mary, like Joseph, like John the Baptist, like Peter and Paul and the apostles, Every one of them said yes to Jesus down the ages, even to our day, even to our day who have said that following you, Jesus Christ, is more important than wealth, is more important than fame, is more important than this particular relationship I may be in right now that I know is destructive, that I need to get out of, is more important than my own life and I will never ever deny you, Jesus, even if they take me and shoot me. Every day in our age, Christians give their life for the simple fact that they are followers of Jesus Christ, marked with the sign of his love on the cross. In our day, not just in the days of the Colosseum and the martyrs, everywhere, because they are filled with this rock-solid love of Jesus. They are filled with this rock-solid knowledge that with him, There is nothing else in life that can satisfy. This is the life of joy and of freedom that is promised to the sons and daughters of Christ. There are obstacles. There are times when we can't feel joyful. I mean, goodness, we know all those things when we've lost a job, when there's someone who is suffering, when there is an illness, when there is some kind of a horrible tragedy or accident. I see this every week as a priest. I'm called to the hospital and see all kinds of things. All kinds of things. But when we know at the deepest level that we are beloved, when we hear the voice of the Father saying to us, and this is what he said to us in our baptism, you are my beloved son, you are my beloved daughter, I am well pleased in you. All the crosses, all the obstacles take on a whole different color, take on a whole different meaning. They can now be joined to that eternal offering of Jesus on the cross, the eternal offering of love. And by that act, we become participants in the redemption of the world. We are joined to that act which brings life, brings salvation to the world. Our life is a life that God has given to us with a particular plan and a purpose so that we are witnesses, beacons, living flames of the joy of the Holy Spirit, the joy of faith and hope and love in our life. We're not made for comfort, but for greatness. We're all made to be heroes, all made to be saints. In the beginning of his encyclical, Pope Francis writes that he invites at this moment, very beginning, third paragraph, As you are reading this, he invites you at this moment to a renewed personal encounter with Jesus Christ. 
No one should think that's, that this invitation is not meant for him, since no one is excluded from the joy brought by the Lord. The Lord does not disappoint those who take this risk. Whenever we take a step towards Jesus, we come to realize that he is already there, waiting for us with open arms. Now, now is the time to say to Jesus, Lord, I have let myself be deceived. In a thousand ways I have shunned your love, yet here I am once more to renew my covenant with you. I need you. Save me once again, Lord. Take me once more into your redeeming embrace. Repent. Recognize the truth of your sinfulness. Surrender. Trust in Jesus. Invite the Holy Spirit to come into your life to give you this gift of joy which is born of the love of Jesus. Say yes to him every day. Every day. Let the trials and tribulations and the annoyances of your life be little pathways into greater trust in the providence of God. Let the big trials, when our plans go awry, when things don't go the way we would have them to go, let those be further invitations to walk more closely with Jesus. Pray. Read the scriptures every day. Prepare for coming to Mass. Prepare for offering your life in the sacrifice of the Eucharist. Pray. Listen to his voice. He is speaking all the time. He is the word of God. And the word of God doesn't just come on at the first reading of Mass on Sunday and then fall silent the rest of the week. Go out of your own shells of these walls that we build up. Love each other. Go to the poor. Give of your life. Give away the way Jesus gives himself away. Follow Our Lady. She will help us do all of these things. This is her eternal task as our mother to really receive the Holy Spirit and have Jesus be born in us. Say yes. Say yes today and now to Jesus. Come and know and taste and feel the joy of the Lord.